The Pran, or Kingpin, presides over a multi-tiered security apparatus that oversees an army of watchmen who roam the prison grounds and ensure inmates obey strict social codes that regulate where they can go, how they can act, and what they can say. There are certain codes that you can't break, like you can't use the word for milk because it can also be misinterpreted, and so you have to, like, you have to know all of these things that, you know, if you say them, then you're going to lose positions in your ranking. Coming new to prison, at first you're most likely going to be sent to the church, and in church they're going to ask you who you are, why are you here, what what are you doing? Do you know anybody in here? When prisoners first arrive, they're judged by the prison government and sorted into one of three distinct social castes, the thugs, the evangelicals, or the renegades. Almost like going into college, like if you get into a frat or not get into a frat depends on who you know, how cool you are, what you've done type of thing. Like it's interesting to see that society has its ways to self-organize at, you know, these different levels, but it's essentially the same thing, you know. The thug is the, the, the people who are the freest inside the prison. The thugs can, you know, not wear a shirt. They can walk wherever they want to. They can smoke, you know, weed or do drugs in the prison. The evangelicals, if they're walking about, they have to have a Bible in their hands and they have to wear a tie. And they're also in charge of cleaning the prison or they're also in charge of cooking. The renegades, the, the ones who are worst off, these are like the prisoners within prison. And it's either because you committed a very, very horrible crime you're a homosexual, like a known homosexual, or you belong to a gang that was an enemy of the Kingpin's gang. In addition to preaching the word of God, the evangelicals are responsible for cleaning the raw sewage and refuse that cover the grounds. They live in the church, which acts as both a place of worship and a prison within the prison. Those who violate the thug code or owe a debt can also be sent to the church. It's like your last warning type of punishment. If you're in the church and, you, and you're and you caught by the kingpin smoke doing something, you're either going get, to get shot in the hand or like corporal punishment some way, or you're going to be sent to the to the renegades. And that's where you don't, you definitely, because you can't get out of that. Once you do that, any any prison that you go to is what called like you're, you have a stain that is not washable. You go to another prison or even the streets, everybody's going to know, no, that guy, that guy has a stain on him because you were giving the opportunity of the church to reform yourself, to no longer be in the world of evil and turn good. The prison's de facto government collects a general tax known as la causa, or the cause, which it uses to purchase goods that come into the prison. If you behave, if you pay your causa, then nobody's gonna mess with you. But if you're outspoken, if you do things wrong, if you're a mischief person, if you're a debtor, if you, if, <laughs> If you're like a bad person for the good living within the prison, then you're going to fare bad. The Venezuelan Bolivar has been destroyed by hyperinflation, but inside, prisoners have created a market system in which they've established their own ad hoc currencies, bartered goods and services, and used systems of credit. The currency that was circulating outside was no longer valid inside the prison. There was a toilet paper shortage at some point in the country and you could still pour, pour adina pan, which is a main like uh, product that we used to make arepas. There were shortages outside and inside the prison, you could still find them. People would go inside the prison to shop. Inmate-run restaurants inside the prison's walls provide an alternative to the food offered by the government. Like there was this guy that I really enjoyed talking to and it was the place that I always went to eat. He had his burger shop, his burgers were amazing. The prison food that the government gave him, it wasn't nearly enough and it was all like, just like rice and like soggy and, and well, I got amibiasis, like amoebas twice. <laughs> it was the worst experience of my life. And the food is the least of the problems created by the government for most inmates. I saw a skeleton and it was moving and I was like, I had to do a double, t I don't I didn't know if it was fear or whatever, and then I looked closer and I saw it was a man who was literally dying. He was only bone and, and some skin like hanging on his, and he had had tuberculosis for nine months. He was an indigenous of the Wayu community who are, who are this, it's like a native community that lives near Colombia. And he was there for stealing a watch and he'd been in prison, I don't know, like two or three years. And the day, supposedly, the day that we got there, me and Gilbert, was the day that the guy had uh, his freedom. And we tried to take him to the hospital, and he just died the next day. Figueredo Thompson says that only about 20% of prisoners have been formally sentenced for a crime. Others languish for years, awaiting trials that may never come. Si 
Que no encontremos aquí prisioneros. Sabemos que somos de lo bueno, tú sabes que somos de lo sincero, mero, mero. You know, from the Free Convict Group, there were 15, you know, 12 of them hadn't been sentenced. And a lot of them just started admitting to sentence because then the time in prison would move faster. Imagine a system in which you have to declare yourself guilty, even if you're not, just so the thing moves faster. The prison population has exploded in recent years as the regime of Hugo Chavez's successor, Nicolas Maduro, has cracked down on mostly poor Venezuelans for alleged petty offenses. There was no economic opportunity. A lot of them are kids, you know, like an 18-year-old guy who's part of the documentary. He doesn't tell the story that much, but it's the guy with the Afro freedom. He was thrown in because he stole a cell phone and he spent three years in a prison in the same space near that like being overruled by guys who had killed 15 people like there's no like maximum security prison only for political prisons mostly so obviously when you have to when you throw somebody into that type of position what are you creating this guy has to survive and he has to pay the causa to to these kingpins and he has to find a way to make a living within this this prison walls you're essentially making him create networks of new crime and new new ways in which to live la las cárceles hoy en día son son campo en donde reflejan la sociedad. No quiere decir que el 100% de la culpa sea del sistema, porque yo no te puedo decir que soy un santo, pero tampoco que andaba tampoco When society doesn't pay attention to culture of rehabilitation, then that's going to start to fester. Entonces tú estás creando un monstruo. O sea, si te dan la libertad también a todos los días sería secuestrado. ¿Qué voy a hacer? Yo voy a hacer. El mundo de la velocidad y la maldad. Mientras que tú trabajas, yo pienso como te rompo. The film builds to a dramatic finish as the military embarks on a campaign to retake several inmate-run prisons, setting up a showdown in 2016 at the prison where Figueredo Thompson shot most of his footage. Little by little, a lot of these prisons have been taken control of. <laughs> The campaign presents the socialist government with both practical and moral dilemmas, since overtaking heavily armed inmates requires mass bloodshed and inevitably kills scores of the wrongfully incarcerated. Figueredo Thompson says officials can't reconcile these actions with their foundational ideology, which preaches compassion and the creation of a new man whose main virtues are selflessness and a commitment to justice. What they call their version of, of revolutionary socialism, how are you going to execute inmates if you're supposed to believe in the new man. You know, el hombre nuevo, like their philosophy. This is their philosophy. The Che Guevara bring in a new, like the new man and to re reform, like, you know, to, to and use the prisons as a way to re-educate and et cetera, et cetera. How do you get to that point? Venezuela's slide into authoritarianism is also deeply personal for Figueredo Thompson and his family. His stepfather, Guillermo Zuluaga, led the last independent TV station in the country after Chavez seized most media outlets. He fought escalating government harassment for years as he exposed the vast human cost of the regime's policies. In 2010, Chavez finally had Zuluaga arrested. He had to leave the country because Chavez named him a political enemy of the revolution. My first year of university was in Venezuela. Uh, and that was the year, or right before that was the year that my stepfather had to leave, my family had to leave. And I was left there alone with my younger brother, Juan. It's really strange to see when a man that you've seen your entire life be, you know, a completely moral man be thrown out of his country for speaking the truth. Because if you didn't question your beliefs, if, you, if you're dogmatic about your beliefs, then there's no room for you to admit error. And I think that's a lot of what's happening in Venezuela is that there's no admittance of error. And they've gone so far down a path that it's very hard to come back from when you become too radicalized in your ideologic position. And I think, you know, that, that's something that, that I've, I've been able to witness and to see firsthand, and, and it's very saddening. Venezuela no era un país violento. Pasó de ser un país no violento a estar entre los cinco países más violentos del mundo. Obvio, mi hijo destrozado, sin cara. 70 disparos en el cuerpo. 
La Causa shines a light on the decline of Venezuelan society and the human rights abuses perpetrated under Chavez and Maduro, as their socialist revolution backpedals further from its promise to empower the downtrodden and celebrate the idea of the new man. La urbe con su deterioro, con su cloaca, con su hedor, con sus prisiones internas en los barrios, esa es una cárcel. But Figueredo Thompson's film also features poignant stories of individuals who have overcome the odds to find redemption, whether or not they ultimately find justice. No solamente eso, después que lo entierro, cuando llego al barrio, me mandan a buscar los muchachos que lo matan. Los hombres llorando, pidiéndome perdón. El mismo momento que los vi, lo perdoné. To be able to get to this level of access to empathy and to understanding, um, that was my experience. You know, a lot of people are too afraid to go into the belly of the beast. And I think if you draw them a picture, starting to see things uh, generate empathy. And I think that's, that, that's the power of film. Tú entras de la puerta de la cárcel para adentro, tú estás en otro estado. Tiene un rango de virtud de maldad, o sea. The inmates have overtaken many prisons in Venezuela. They're armed with heavy weapons and grenades. Ahora no mismo policía que le entrega en contra de la AMPA. Ahora está en mano de la AMPA en contra de la policía. Por eso no hizo esto, mátelo. Era la orden que daba yo. Y si no lo hacía, se morían ellos. The prisons are governed by criminal gangs led by a pran, or kingpin, who strictly enforces the thug code by which all prisoners must abide, or they will be shot in various body parts. It's too dangerous for Venezuelan troops to enter, so they patrol the perimeter and train their rifles on any inmate who tries to leave. The prisoners have formed functional, independent societies with open-air bazaars offering everything from Coca-Cola to cocaine. Several days a week, they welcome their girlfriends, wives, children, and extended families for visits, birthday parties, and even festivals. La Causa, a new documentary from 29-year-old filmmaker Andres Figueredo Thompson, is a raw look at life inside what at the time of filming was the country's largest prison. The film explores the structure of its self-organized society, where dissenters and those deemed social radicals were treated harshly, and LGBT inmates were cast out and forced to live on the roof of a building. No. No. Figueredo Thompson started capturing remarkable footage in the prison in 2010, as the socialist strongman president Hugo Chavez dismantled democratic institutions and seized control of private businesses. The year after Figueredo Thompson began production on La Causa, Chavez declared his stepfather an enemy of the state, forcing his family to flee to the U.S. But he continued filming on return trips to Venezuela over the following eight years. Senior year in high school was the first time I entered a prison. The experience was, was incredibly, incredibly just overwhelming, you know, seeing inmates with weapons, with grenades, the smell, you know, seeing literally excrement coming from the walls, just the amount of, you know, open sewers everywhere, absolutely deplorable conditions. It, it felt almost like a war zone, like post-apocalyptic thing. To see the children, like children going in and out of the prison, the underbelly of crime in Venezuela, being around guns, being around crack, being, you know, that guy that was selling crack and cocaine with the, chi the, the baby in, in his arms. You filmed this over the course of eight years. How did you start going into prisons in Venezuela when you were a senior in high school? Yeah, I met this guy who's in the documentary, Gilbert Caro. He's the he's the politician guy. Me and my brother had an NGO, and we used to build recreational parks in the slums. And he told me the story of when he was a kingpin um, and how he had transformed himself. But I was 17, and I told him, "Man, I want to do a documentary about this." I even had to make a fake ID. Uh, to be able to get into the prison. How did you sort of ingratiate yourself in this community that they were willing to let you film them? They always knew what was going on and they were okay with it. Because I think there's also that element of of pride <laughs> in some sense of being in that world or of sh wanting to show their life. 
Explíqueme qué están haciendo aquí, pues. Bueno, aquí estamos rellenando las piñas. Rellenando las... But it was really interesting to see inside the power vacuum that they had filled. Before these, you know, kingpins came to power, it used to be like no man's land. And, to, and, and there used to be a lot more bloodbaths. Prácticamente que nosotros tenemos armas aquí para por lo menos tener un control contra todo, ¿comprende? Aquí nosotros no nos podemos defender si no tenemos armas, ¿no? El AMPA tiene un tribunal. Si me, me dicta matarlo, y si no, meterle, meterle un barriguero, y si no, un patero. With kingpins, there was more selective violence. It was more like Hammurabi code type of an eye for an eye type of thing. But you could leave your cell phone in the prison, and if your cell phone got lost, somebody was going to be responsible. And it was really hard for you. Like, I would leave, you know, my wallet or my things just in, like, in the music studio that we built. And nothing would disappear in a place where it's surrounded by thieves. So th there was this type of military dictatorship code, which was really weird. That I I'm not saying that I support it, but it was a type of system that created some type of order from the previous chaos.